but right now we're going to go to panel six. Um, panel six is, as it says here, utilizing emerging technology to drive regenerative growth for all. Regenerative growth for all is Regenibus's purpose statement. We fundamentally believe that if we get this plant right in all of its guises and the way in which we treat it and build it out, then we will see regenerative growth for all. That's a big, big ask. But there are some technologies out there that will also help drive the rapidity of change. And there is a geek amongst us. Uh, it's fair to say that Larry Ketchesid, the CEO of Media Sorcery, is the geek of all geeks. And I mean that in the most politest way. He is really quite something. In fact, when I asked him um, if he could just share with me some bio, because the bio on the website is, nah, it's okay. But I know Larry. And, uh, and, and so he, said, he sent this. Now, I'm not sure if he wrote it or his brother wrote it, but it says something like this. Larry is now finally a faster runner than his older brother. That's Terry over there. And then this one, I think Terry might have written this one. Larry has degrees in meth, physics, and computer science. Is that meth or math? Whatever you want. Man. Yeah, OK. <laughs> All right. And um, we don't need any, uh, you don't need me to tell you this. Uh, Larry has an improving tennis shoe collection. Uh huh. And uh, for his sins, he worked at Compaq Computer Corporation for 15 years. Um, he saved the best to last. I know this one is definitely from Larry. He truly believes his grandchildren are the best grandchildren. <laughs> Larry, come on out. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. So the way to be faster than your brother is to wait until your brother stops running and then keep running. So, and I do have the best grandchildren. Hi, Allie. Hi, Trev. Hi, Tyler. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, how to use something called crypto economics to drive sustainable projects. And that may sound like it's a little bit of a square peg in a round hole at this conference. But I, I think when we go through the slides, uh, and I I'd only have about 120 slides, and I'm the last panel, so I hope you guys have a lot of patience. So the, the first thing I want to show is we've talked about the IPCC report for climate change before. So this is one of the charts out of the 120-page PDF summary of the 400-page IPCC report. And what this tries to show is a categorization of all the projects that could reduce net emission reductions for, for climate change. And I, I broke it in half because it's just hard to read. And if you look down here, these are a lot of the ones that would fall under the regenerative sustainable projects list, right? Regenerative agriculture, regenerative viral culture, those types of projects. And if you don't know regenerative agriculture, it's, it's a natural way of farming. Don't till the soil. Uh, don't use a lot of fertilizer. Multiple crop plants. Uh, industrial hemp is very, very good for it. And Kim Kovacs, who's going to come up here, is an expert in that area, and I'm not overselling that. So longer bars, bigger impact, and if you look at this chart, these have a lot of the longer bars. But this next chart is from a company called uh, Climate Tech Venture Capital. And, and they kind of cherry picked some of the, of the projects, but if you look, you know, ecosystem restoration, which is one of the big regenerative ones, has the most impact on this side, but has hardly any venture capital money. The venture capital money goes for the sexy stuff, right? Venture capital money goes to electronic vehicles, carbon removal, those kinds of things. So if there's any venture capital companies or family offices out there, I'm sure the CEOs of the companies that are going to join me on the panel will gladly consider your offers for money because the projects they're doing are actually sequestering carbon. So. My meth, meth degree, my math degree makes me want to give an equation, right? So this is, crypto economics is not something that I invented. It's been the product of a lot of blockchain enthusiasts. And blockchain gets almost as bad a rap as cannabis does in the industry. But from a computer science perspective, blockchain just gives us tools to do things like prove 
uh, transactions with transparency or store things in a decentralized way so that will engender trust for everybody. So what the, the equation that I like to use is if you can prove that a project was sustainable, whether it was a, a regenerative agriculture, regenerative bioculture, whatever kind of a project, even the transportation of medical cannabis that you want to show that it actually was the product that you thought it was all the way through. And then to get that proof, you put out sensors, uh, Internet of Things sensors, you know, to measure whatever you want. Measure the track of the medical cannabis, measure soil moisture, measure temperature, measure humidity, whatever. And then you may need to put out a network to cover those sensors. Um, and then you can use all that proof to get carbon credits. And the crypto economic cycle says, if I, there are sensors that I can put out there where crypto economics will give me back cryptocurrencies just for providing that sensor data out there. So I, I want to measure something to prove something, and I'm going to do that as part of my, my work anyway. Why don't I get compensated? Why don't I get a crypto incentive for doing that? Extending the network coverage does the same thing. I get a crypto economic incentive for extending the coverage for that sensor data, and I can use that to build a bigger network on top of it. And then I can use all that data and go apply for a carbon credit. And I can apply for that carbon credit on a transparent blockchain where I can say, maybe I want to get a voluntary carbon credit first, and then I want to get one that's uh, moderated, and then I want to go get one that's certified. But I've got all the data, and I can keep all the data in a transparent way that everybody can go look at it. Um, and then you can take all this and put it back into the mix so that it can be used for more projects or enhance the projects that are out there. There's a, there's a thing called this decentralized autonomous organization. I don't know if Christine's still here, but the people's ecosystem has a DAO, and we've talked to them about using this and pushing some of these cryptocurrencies back in the DAO so that you can help the people that are part of the DAO and, and lift everybody up with these projects. So when I, when I think about this circle, it just kind of looks like this, right? You go, you go get your regenerative project. I don't know if you guys can see with these chairs, but I'm going to pretend that you can. You get these regenerative crypto projects or these regenerative sus uh, sustainable projects, and you go put out meters in the middle of a field or out you know, close to the water, and you measure them, and you provide that data, and you get incentive crypto for providing that data. Then you go, if the coverage isn't there, you provide the coverage and you get more incentive crypto for providing that coverage, right? And then you use all that proof and you go prove that you did a carbon credit project uh, and then you recycle it again. This, this picture is of a book called Green Pill. There's a great podcast called Green Pill that talks about this crypto economic regeneration that if you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend it. So the good thing about this is since we're at the United Nations uh, and Jeff has pounded the SDGs into me and to everybody as he should, each one of these pieces supports many of the different kinds of, of sustainable development goals. So the, the cycle is a, is a nice procreating cycle. So there's a lot of people trying to do this. Let me show you a quick roadmap of one way to do this that, that we're doing it. So, so that first piece was to show proof, right? I want to show proof that I'm doing a transparent project. I want to show maybe proof and quality of the products. I'm, I'm maybe I want to show that the product actually came from a regenerative agricultural environment or a regenerative bioculture environment. Um, and I want to prove that I'm doing a sustainable project and get some kind of credit for that proof. So one example of this, uh, this is one we did for a medical cannabis company called Nature's Key. Uh, they're my partners. They're here in the audience. And, and this is a uh, put the proof on a distributed ledger, a decentralized storage mechanism so everybody can see it. So in this case, the proof might be uh, the lab testing results for a distillate. The lab does the results. They get a PDF. We put it on uh, IPFS, which is a decentralized storage system, or Arweave. So it's there. Um, if you want to use the word non-fungible token, which I absolutely abhor that word, it's, a, it's something that won't change. So it's out there and it's proof and everybody can use it. And you can do the same thing with the product samples. Lab reports are out there, transactions on the blockchain. Everybody can see it all the way through. So if you want to see that your product came from a particular type of producer or that it actually was pure all the way through, it, it's all out there on the blockchain for people to view. 
You can put a QR code on the product, let somebody scan it before they buy it, and there it is. So then the second part is putting out sensors. So we've started putting sensors in some regenerative farm so that we could prove out this concept. This is actually a, uh, some sensors from a farm owned by a, another partner company called Pacalifa, which Delia is, a, is an advisor for, and she'll talk more about that. But we put uh, soil pH sensors, soil moisture sensors, weather sensors, and we're starting to receive crypto rewards, and we're providing that data back to the farmers so they can see um, the results of the changes that they make in their sustainable farm. Did, if I plant this cover crop with this crop, is it better? Is the soil better? Is it making the farm more productive and is it making the products more productive? And then we had to, we had to provide coverage because this, uh, this is down in Michoacan, Mexico. There's, there is no coverage, there is no 5G. So we built the network, we extended a crypto network called Helium, which provides uh, an Internet of Things network for all these types of sensors and, and lots more. <clears throat> so when we put that out there, <laughs> the, the interesting part is, for the most part, coverage is only where the cities are, right? Most technology start where people are. So this, this is a map of the Helium network, and it's, it's where people are. It's, it's not where the farms are. It's not where a lot of the regenerative projects that we want. So, and if you drill down, this is uh, Mexico by the Pacific Ocean where we went to the farm. And this over here is the three lonely little hotspots that we put up. This one's in Ixtapa. There's a big mango tree farm where they're planting industrial hemp. So it's a nice uh, regenerative agricultural farm. This is Nespa, and then there's another farm up here. So we, the, the point I'm making is sometimes the coverage is gonna be there and sometimes it's not. Those areas have pretty much nothing. So this is, this is Alejandro. My wife told me not to get up on any roofs while I was in Mexico, and Alejandro weighs about half as much as I did, so we made him get up on the roof and put the antenna up there, so smart thinking. But this is the only internet for probably a 50 mile radius. I mean, it's a huge satellite dish. So, you know, a, as this crypto economic cycle goes on, we are uh, paying the people that have this uh, internet service so that we can use part of that internet service and then gain some crypto economic incentives back by providing that coverage because the farm the, that we want is about 100 meters that way, right? So it's, the moral of the story is, it, you're gonna have to extend the network and don't get on the roof if you weigh as much as I do. So we've done these pieces, right? So what, what we're working on now is taking all of this data and figuring out how we can go um, either do it through the certification bodies, which I, I, I know a lot of you know, the certification bodies for carbon take a long time. But there are several blockchain-based, for transparency, carbon credit exchanges where you can just go take this data and say, um, I, I think this is worth this much carbon credit. And you, you're, you're postulating it, but you're showing proof, right? You're showing data out there. And then you can go to other ones, like there's one called Regen Network. So the Regen Network has a way that you propose your project, and they have smart people that know what that carbon output might be like, and they go through your methodology, and they, they say, well, I think it's this or that. And then they've also got an onboard for Vero, uh, certification organization type. So you, you can go voluntary, you know, moderated, and then certified, and apply for your carbon credit. And you can do all this automatically. So if we get all this data, we don't have to have somebody write up a report. We can just send it out on the blockchain and wait for it to come back as a carbon credit. That, to me, that's cool. I mean, I, I think that's, as Jeff said, the geek in me comes out when I, when I think about it, because all of this stuff can run without a human being interfacing it. You can get all that data and just let it ride. And then the bottom part says you start it over again. So there are, the, the blockchain world gets uh, a, a certain reputation for making a lot of money on their Bitcoin, going off and buying a Lamborghini, and then just not caring. But, but there's a huge amount of blockchain uh, uh, acolytes that have um, regenerative project systems. So there's the gentleman that wrote the Green Pill book is a gentleman named Kevin Owaki, and he founded a, a group called Gitcoin. And Gitcoin was a way to use crypto economics to fund open source software. 
uh, and they did that for several years, but then they started branching out and they now fund climate change projects. They now fund regenerative agricultural projects. And when I mean fund, they're giving you cryptocurrency. You, you can go in and say, here's all my data for my proof of my project. I'd like to go do this 500 other times, Put, fill out a grant request, different cryptocurrency companies will come and match that grant request and then you've got a grant and, and it's a grant. It's not an equity request, it's not a debt request, it's a grant and you can go off and, and do your project. And they've been doing it for a long time. The last quarter they gave away $57 million. So that, I mean, that's out there. And it's, if you go back to that first slide, if, if the venture capital money is going elsewhere, you know, people like Kim and Delia and the, all the other people, like our partners at Pakalifa, can go use those to get money to fund these projects. So again, I, this, this circle, I think, works. It works automatically. It, it, it really gives you a way to, to convince the farmers who may not see why they should be doing regenerative agriculture or why they should be doing regenerative bioculture, you can tell them because it will fund itself. I mean, there's reasons they should do it anyway, right? It's good for the earth. It's good for the people. The food's better. The honey that I got from the regenerative farm is much better. I mean, all the products are better, but sometimes they need a little bit of incentive to push them along. So if you incentivize them with uh, cryptocurrency from their sensors, there's a company out of Greece called WeatherXM. WeatherXM is building a, a portable weather station. You can go get it for 400 euros. And, as, and what their value proposition is hyper-local weather, which farmers need anyway. So if you provide your weather back, guess what they give you? They give you cryptocurrency for sharing that data. There's, there's a lot of companies that are taking that model out there. Then you build the network. The, the other important part about this network building is it's, it's a standard right now for sensors. But on top of that, you can, give, you can put 5G. So it, that picture that I showed where there's just a satellite dish, there's no 5G out there, but if, you, if we're gonna go build a network for sensor data anyway, we can put 5G on top of it, and then we can put Wi-Fi on top of it. So we're actually helping the community while they're helping themselves by gaining some crypto. And then we go prove our, our projects and get our carbon credits and, and the circle continues. So that's my, that's my brief, what I think crypto economics they are. Um, I'm excited to talk about this with the panel because Kim and Delia have actually done these kind of projects. I'm not a farmer. I'm a, I'm a geek, apparently, with a meth degree, which from Trinity University, I might say. So, But that's my spiel. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for sticking in.